imagine for a moment that George Gershwin and Sergei Rachmaninoff could meet up in the future and write a piano concerto together. A pianist would need eight hands to play that piece. Unless you're, I don't know, Yu Jia Wang. Now what if I told you this music already exists? It's crazy, like some of the part, you know, I'm like at the extreme end of the piano and I feel like an octopus, <laughs> pretty much. Enter Teddy Abrams, composer and music director of the Louisville Orchestra, who describes his piano concerto as what would happen if Rachmaninoff and Gershwin had a musical child, but in the 23rd century. And as you might expect, it's damn hard. It's, it's well, I'm looking at the score, I have no idea how I played some of the stuff. <laughs> it's like... I couldn't play this in a million years. The richness of the, the harmonies, the language, and, and how many notes you put in there was kind of very much like Rachmaninoff and the jazziness of Gershwin. The main feature on Yuja's new album, The American Project, the piece is a rich portrait of American musical life seen through the lens of a romantic piano concerto. It has that in common with Rhapsody in Blue, which Gershwin conceived as, in his own words, a musical kaleidoscope of America. So I was thinking about the Rhapsody in Blue. It's, it's the most iconic American piano concerto, of course, but it's also a weird piece to program. It's, you know, 15 minutes long. So the question always is, what else are you gonna program with it? So Teddy set out to write a companion piece for Yuja to pair with the Rhapsody in Blue. I called you and you said, oh, that's, that's yeah, that cool. Yeah, that sounds lovely. But then he got a little carried away. And by the time I finished the sketches, it was probably like 48, 49 minutes of actual music that I then chopped down. I'm Ben Lottie, head of piano here at Tone Bass. And in this video, I'm going to deconstruct the awe-inspiring Abrams Concerto, making sense out of its near-impossible virtuosity and tracing its influences from Beethoven to bebop, from blues to rock to blues rock, with exclusive insights from the composer who wrote it and the pianist who premiered it. Yuja makes this part up coming up. She made it even harder to play. I was fortunate to get to meet up with Teddy and Yuja backstage at Disney Hall just after Yuja had performed Rachmaninoff's fourth piano concerto with Gustavo Dunamal and the LA Phil. The three of us took a deep dive into Teddy's new concerto, and it felt like going on a magic carpet ride across two centuries of music history. Speaking from experience, I cannot recommend better music to have stuck in your head for months. It does become a year warmer and you just like wake up grooving it. There is another party right. coming every every two seconds. Like when I was playing, it's like, damn, I wish I wrote this. It's super fun. So much fun that is this a serious composition or just a mishmash of unrelated genres? We'll take a look at that too. But whether you think it's high art or entertainment, the piece is a marvel. You're going to want to listen. So when you're ready, follow the link that just appeared there to order, stream, or download the album. With that said, go ahead and hop on this magic carpet with Yuja, Teddy, and me, plus a few tone based artists we'll pick up along the way, and get ready to enter a whole new world of musical fantasy. Do you trust me? Okay, that's all very cute, but let me just get one thing straight. People are still writing piano concertos? Well, yes. In fact, Teddy's is the third new piano concerto commissioned for Yuja in the last five years alone. First, there was John Adams's Must the Devil Have All the Good Tunes in 2019. Then more recently, in 2022, Magnus Lindbergh's third piano concerto itself a kind of musical child, not of Rachmaninoff and Gershwin like the Abrams, but Rachmaninoff and Bartok. Damn, Rachmaninoff really gets around. The composer have this thing, they love to write lots of notes for me for some reason. Yeah, I wonder why that is. Your ability to listen and digest, your brain works like a supercomputer. <laughs> It also helps when, like Lindbergh and Abrams both, the composer knows their way around the piano. I love that because like Rahman and Prokofiev, when they're pianists themselves, they just, they make it sound harder <laughs> than it actually is. Pianistic or not, they're still pretty hard. Would you say that Abrams is pianistic? He's pianistic, he's very pianistic. <laughs> That's good. Here's the thing, I, I cannot play this. <laughs> Things were a little easier for Mozart, who, 
lived in a time when composers were more economical with their notes. And Mozart wrote piano concertos to perform himself. And to begin to understand what makes the Abrams concerto tick, it helps to pay a quick visit to Mozart's Vienna in the 1780s. You know, we look at Mozart as clearly our father of the piano concerto. I mean, he wrote so many of them. 27 to be exact. And almost all of them begin with an extended orchestral tutti before the piano even enters. And this goes on and on and the piano sits there. 250 years later, and the Abrams Concerto begins with its own kind of orchestral tutti, although more of an overture than a proper concerto exposition, but nevertheless, still a nod to the roots of the genre. But you sort of, in a way, like go back to the classical period, right? Yeah. This is actually in a really strict, pretty traditional form. Where Teddy is definitely not conventional is in his choice of musical material in the opening. The syncopated thing, which is... That's classic Delta Blues offbeat material that you'll hear in John Lee Hooker that was then reinterpreted by a lot of 60s and 70s bands that were obsessed with like the early blues artists. Bands like the Rolling Stones, as heard in their cover of blues artist Slim Harpo's Shake Your Hips. Or perhaps even more iconic, ZZ Top's LaGrange. Teddy's piece and you're like, I am on a time machine to American music. And this is really an American concerto, it yeah. really is. This couldn't be written any, anywhere else. The Abrams concerto is filled with Americana. As the overture progresses, it recalls the big band sound world of Duke Ellington, as well as Paul Whiteman and Ferdi Grofe, who originally orchestrated Rhapsody in Blue for its premiere with Paul Whiteman and his band in 1924. Gershwin was kind of the spiritual grandfather of the concerto that I wrote. Whereas Gershwin wrote his Rhapsody at the dawn of the jazz age, Teddy is composing with the whole of 20th century popular music in his rearview mirror. And his concerto is a grand homage to the musical inheritance of the 20th century. These are really specific styles that are that are being conjured at any at any time. It's not just the idea of something that's vaguely jazzy. It's like this this is meant to sound like you know a Benny Goodman kind of swing groove. This is meant to sound like Bop. In addition to expanded brass and percussion sections, the Abrams Concerto calls for an entirely separate jazz band to keep the groove going. There's even a Gene Krupa Tom Tom section. In the first cadenza Yuja plays, you can hear allusions to Art Tatum and Jerry Lee Lewis. It's like listening to the evolution of American popular music, rooted in the blues but branching off and flowering into different styles, from jazz and swing to rock and roll, soul, funk, disco, R&B, you name it. I have this, this mark like Nile Rogers style funk at bar for 81, which is in the guitar. He's one of the great American musicians of the last 50 years, but a lot of people know him from Daft Punk, where he plays on uh, um, Get Lucky. And he's, he does this drumming thing on, on the guitar, which is really distinctive. It's... Yeah, it's mm. this is I thought I was a melody. I didn't hear the guitar when I was playing. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's like a Latin groove behind it. So this is like a slowly bubbling Latin groove underneath. I mean, so the, the influence of Afro-Cuban rhythm on all of jazz cannot be overstated. Like, I mean, that that really is where so much of the rhythmic sensibilities come from. So that's what, what I'm kind of drawing here. Like, it starts off with you playing this, like, nice little romantic It's the arpeggio thing. Exactly. And that becomes more and more, like, intense and eventually bubbles up into this, you know, <laughs> yeah. 
which is like Latin and some rap at the same time. Uh -huh. You know, it's like in the club. <laughs> when they sing. I love the percussion. Have you heard percussionists sing? It's the best thing. Ding, 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 ding. I haven't even mentioned the allusions to the Beatles, Broadway, spaghetti western soundtracks, John Williams film scores, and there's even a nod to 80s electronica. Clearly, we've come a long way from the American sound world heard in Rhapsody in Blue. Nevertheless, the medium through which Teddy explores these different popular styles was the romantic piano concerto tradition hailing from Europe. In the 1910s, teenage George Gershwin was a regular concert goer in New York City. And it was in the audience at Carnegie Hall where he heard many of the great piano concertos of the 19th century. Between 1920 and 1923, in the years leading up to the composition of Rhapsody in Blue, Rachmaninoff's second and third piano concertos were each performed on eight separate occasions in Carnegie Hall, most of them with the composer at the piano. And George wasn't some passive concert goer, but cultivated a habit of intensive listening. He would later write, I've gone to concerts and listened so earnestly that I became saturated with the music. Then I went home and listened in memory. I sat at the piano and repeated the motifs. Some of those motifs may have come from Edvard Grieg's piano concerto, a staple of symphony orchestra programs to this day. Pianist composer Percy Granger, a Gershwin and Grieg enthusiast and a friend to both, wrote that the main theme of Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue is obviously derived from the theme with which Grieg closes his piano concerto. In both, a pair of triplets move from the flat seventh to the fifth by way of the sixth, while the chords below in both cases display the clash of a sharp seventh. The Grieg concerto also made a big impression on teenage Rachmaninoff, who used it to model the opening of his first piano concerto. And the beginning is basically Grieg on steroids. It begins with two bars in the brass, and then there's this cascade of octaves. Which, of course, was stolen directly from the Grieg concerto. But stolen, influenced. I mean, here's one great composer taking his hat off to another. Double octave chordal passage work like this is a staple of 19th century piano concertos, and these kinds of flourishes run throughout Grieg and Rachmaninoff's. So you can imagine where Gershwin may have gotten an idea like this. And yet, the influence ran in both directions. Gershwin biographer Howard Polak writes that Rachmaninoff assiduously attended Gershwin's performances. That includes the 1924 premiere plus another performance of it a decade later, just a few months before Rachmaninoff would compose his own Rhapsody, this one on a theme of Paganini, which includes this moment. If you were listening carefully, those were the same exact notes that Gershwin used, just going up instead of down. So what about Abrams? Well, he chose to ride the escalator down, like Gershwin. By the end of the 19th century, the piano concerto had ascended to a genre akin to an action movie, with the soloist playing the role of the heroic protagonist. When suddenly the pianist gets into the octaves, you know, that could be the car chase. Are you Batman up there? Or are you <laughs> Superman? I mean, which, which hero are you on stage? Now, Batman is my kind of superhero. Right, right. He was an actual guy. And just like Batman is an actual guy named Bruce, the hero of the Abrams Concerto is an actual gal named Muja. And just like superheroes have origin stories, so do piano concertos. Most famously, Rachmaninoff was inspired to write his second piano concerto after being hypnotized every day for three months by psychiatrist Nikolai Dahl. Curing the extreme writer's block Rachmaninoff experienced after the premiere of his first symphony totally bombed. Then there's Gershwin, who, 
learned from an article in the newspaper that he was at work on a jazz concerto to premiere on a concert just five weeks away. Well, that was news to George, who turned to his immediate surroundings for some quick inspiration, finding music in the rattling ostinatos of a train he was taking to Boston. Abrams' piano concerto origin story begins back in the mid-2000s, when Yuja and Teddy encountered each other for the first time in the hallowed halls of the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia. Uh, Yuja came, she was an old lady, she was 15. Uh, there was a kid about that. And a few years later, Teddy arrived. I was 18, I think she was about that age. We met and she asked me to be her piano accompanist during her lessons, because even pianists that are learning concertos need somebody to play the orchestra part. <laughs> How do you end up dragging him into your lessons, putting the biggest concertos? Uh... Oh, I don't have a problem dragging people <laughs> into what I need to do. <laughs> what you would do is call at the last minute and be like, I'm playing Prokofiev third concerto, rock two, and emperor concerto in my lesson. It's in 20 minutes. Can do you it. Play? <laughs> at least it was the rock two accompaniment, yeah. not the rock yeah. three accompaniment. We did that too. So I was listening to all this and playing second piano with you. Yeah. I mean, it was incredible because we really have a dialogue about it. And the thing is, like, I would say as a conductor, here's how I would approach this. And instantly you'd be able to just, like, try that. Yeah, yeah. Which, I just, I was so hungry for ideas, and but not many people can actually give that idea in that level. So basically, if Yuja is Batman, Teddy is Pennyworth, the trusted butler who's always there in a pinch to offer the support Batman needs to succeed in his missions, like playing big, hard, romantic piano concertos. And with a piece as complex as Rock 3, you have to accept that you're just playing one part in a larger whole. Well, let's take a work like Rock 1 and a third piano concerto. There's only one way, in my opinion, that a piece like that's going to work. It's going to work if the conductor leads the whole piece. This is a symphonic concerto, after all, written after the Brahms second, when the piano and orchestras now are equal partners and make different color combinations. Mostly there, you see the pianist's hands moving, but you don't hear anything. And then I'll hear what you have to say after I play. For yes. a Whether it's a character or the mood, you just have a much clearer uh, vision of it. And also, you kind of digest and download what he said to, to your own language, like, very easily. Teddy and Yuja's friendship was founded on piano concertos. So it's fitting that Teddy would eventually compose one for her. Uh, by the way, I didn't even tell you when I was actually writing it. I was like, I don't want to jinx it. So. What is it like yeah. you receive a score? It's really freeing to not have recordings before, not have, you know, not have anyone know the existence of this piece of music, and you're the one that brings it to life. Not only were there no recordings to find out how the piece goes, the piece didn't even go yet. Even when I practice, I can practice all I want. I thought I was pretty solid, and then I go to the rehearsal, and I was like, oh, that's how it goes. That's the sound. You know, I can only imagine the beginning, the grooving part, and then when I heard it, I was like, oh my god, this is so exciting. <laughs> it's like if Teddy were a jockey at the Kentucky Derby, and when he reached the home stretch, riding on his horse named Piano Concerto, a second jockey, Yuja, jumps on the saddle, and the two of them ride to the finish line together. I relied on you as we were not only uh, working on the composition side, but in the rehearsal period, and then most importantly, in the editing period with the recording. Your, your way of, of, of looking at material and then filtering it and processing it and sharing that is really, really brilliant. And that's not something maybe everybody understands about your musical capabilities, but they should. It feels great to be heard to be, <laughs> and to yeah. be understood. Like you have to be on the same wavelengths to get, oh, that's what you're saying. Because sometimes it's like, you know, a little mystifying. <laughs> In many ways, Teddy and Yuja's collaboration was a return to those piano concerto rehearsals and Curtis practice rooms a decade and a half before. A conductor and a pianist trying to realize a complex concerto score. The only difference here is one of them is also the composer, and it helps that he's a bit of a brainiac. He always had a pencil oh, here. Oh my god. Well, <laughs> well he's gotta be able to. Do you know what? I used to have two pencils behind my ear. MTT got one of the pencils <laughs> yeah. and threw it. Oh. And he said, one pencil is endearing. Two pencils are eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm glad That's you got you daring. Reaction. 
Teddy mentioned MTT. That stands for Michael Tilson Thomas, famed music director of the San Francisco Symphony and the composer of the first track on the American Project. It's called You'll Come Here Often, and it was inspired by his grandmother, Bessie Tomaszewski. It's one of the three pieces that he wrote back when he was before 20, and he's revisiting those pieces, and he's just kind of very sneakily giving it to me. <laughs> so I just take a look, just take a look. And then I love the smile he had when I first like just um, surprised him with it in a concert. With him, there's always theatrical elements behind it, and I, I thought it was a perfect compliment to Teddy's <laughs> piece. MTT even finds his way into the Abrams Concerto. By the way, there is a connection with Michael's music. This, this in fact, this whole thing, like that, that kind of came to me when I was doing MTT's piece called Four Preludes on Playthings of the Wind. Especially in the cadenza at the end when it's yeah. orchestrated mm -hmm. a little differently in, in, in the piano part than the, in the beginning. That's a, a direct quote of that piece. It's sneakily put in there, but the main theme actually is derived from that. If Gershwin was the spiritual grandfather of the Abrams Concerto, MTT was the spiritual father. I mean, Michael's the reason that, it, that I'm sitting here. When I was nine years old, I went to my very first orchestra concert. It was all Gershwin, San Francisco Symphony, and I'd never been to an, an orchestra concert before. And within five minutes of watching Michael conduct that program, I said, I want to be a conductor. I wrote him a letter and asked for conducting lessons. I went on and on and on. Like, it was a 10-page, very long letter. MTT wrote back this incredible letter, which I have hanging on my wall to this day, because he gave me the, the advice and, like, the permission to do what I wanted to do because I dreamed of being a conductor back then and that's what I'm doing now. I mean, for me, I know him from the Keeping Score and he's like the lineage of, of Bernstein who is the, the Young People's Concert is like how I got so much into classical music. Now this time we're going to be talking about what makes American music sound American. And music from America had this kind of punch to it. Could be savage or provocative or hugely entertaining. It had a kind of openness. Leonard Bernstein was actually a mentor to MTT, passing the torch as a leading conductor, composer, and pianist of his era, and a champion of American music, including, of course, Gershwin. I myself had to learn Gershwin's second Rhapsody a few years back, and it was this MTT recording of the two Rhapsodies with the LA Phil that first introduced me to this very underrated piece. Michael was the one that really brought that piece yeah. back to life. Michael worked with Ira Gershwin, not, I mean, not George, they obviously didn't That's do That's crazy, that. I just love what he's Ira. talking about, like, when I was in this party with Stravinsky and Copeland. <laughs> like... yeah. he, he worked with Stravinsky, yeah. he, was, he was the accompanist for Heipitz and Piatigorsky's studio here in L.A. I mean, he, That's he uh, collaborated with James Brown, like, you, you, you just named Brown. Aretha Franklin. Oh yeah, yeah, he toured with James Brown. And Michael's relationship to popular music is one that I really admire, because like, Michael has such a distinctive voice as a composer. I think that that's the same thing with Bernstein and Gershwin and Copeland, that they've all been able to take American popular sound and be authentic to themselves. MTT, in turn, has been a mentor to Teddy Abrams, who has that same insatiable desire to share his talent, knowledge, and passion for music, especially American music of all stripes, with everyone around him, including you, John. Yeah, I remember playing Gershwin because I think I'm playing with MTT, and then I was like, right. I don't think I get this thing. And I remember you were like freaking out about wanting to like get, get all the jazzy style and all this stuff. Right. And I watched this overnight, like each night that you would just, it was like you were in the Matrix and you'd go through <laughs> the place where you could download new sound packs and like the next day would be like, you'd had another 10 years like of experience ball. playing jazz. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. It's like my, my filter before I play from That's anywhere. Fine. He has a way of like letting you see the music. Oh, and just one more thing about MTT. Also, I find him extremely good looking. <laughs> Well, so, <laughs> he always has the best glasses. Yeah, exactly. They're blue. That's his favorite color. Damn. The point is, the Abrams Concerto embodies all the values espoused by his mentor and his mentor's mentor. And there's another element in Teddy's All-American Concerto that needs to be mentioned. The elephant in the room. Improvisation. <laughs> I 
I don't know what that is. It's my improvisation. I'm still a musician too. See, for the most part, we classical pianists don't improvise. The concert pianist's role over the last century solidified around the performing of other people's music. And our training tends to just be geared around that. There are exceptions, of course, one being pianist and tone bass artist Noam Sivan, who, in addition to being at home in contemporary styles, is also able to improvise fugues and sonatas on the spot. He's making that up. Noam used to teach an improvisation class at Curtis, and among his students was none other than Yu Jia Wang. Another classically trained musician with improv skills is Teddy Abrams, as is on display in his Tiny Desk concert, where you can watch him perform Beethoven sandwiched between improvisations. Teddy's ability to cross over between fully notated classical music and popular styles rooted in improvisation is reflected in his concerto, where at one point he calls for the soloist to improvise an extended section with the house jazz combo that's core to the orchestration. What is going through your head when you're about to have to lose makeup song completely? I thought I was going to lose my shit. Uh <laughs> Can we imagine learning a language only by reading, memorizing, and reciting written texts without being able to speak that language fluently? Of course not. Similarly, we should not let the study of music suffer from this unnatural approach. That's why critical listening is a much bigger part of a jazz musician's training, as compared with a classical musician who tends to study historical styles like their Latin, a dead language, pieces of which a small priesthood memorizes and recites at ritual gatherings. Oh God, what have I done with my life? I love jazz, I love listening to jazz, so when he mentions something, I know what he's talking about. When a classical pianist wants to speak jazz, they tend to reach for pieces by jazz-influenced composers who've written out all the notes in advance. I mean, remind me of uh, Kapust in the Unquiet Place uh, everywhere. And indeed, there are many passages in the Abrams Concerto where Teddy has written out all the notes for the soloist to imitate certain iconic jazz improvisation styles. This is so cool. It's written out for me. It's like a shorthand for what? Pretending I could improvise. <laughs> As the curtain rises towards the end of the overture, Yuja glisses her way onto the scene with ringing tremolos in the right hand, a la Earl Hines. Then as the band fades out, Yuja's left hand emerges with a walking bass marked backside of the beat. Then after some faux improvised chordal riffs, Yuja's right hand takes off. It feels like written out our Tatum. Can you do, your dream is to be able to just like come up with that at yeah, your hat, some yeah. spot. Yeah. yeah, without scores. But it sounds like you're, you, you've interpreted it exactly <laughs> authentically. In doing her best Art Tatum impression, Yuja has to let go of certain conventions that stem from her classical training. I don't know, I see some videos now everywhere on YouTube, like the jazz musicians there. The way they use their hand is like rubber. It's not none of the. You know, the... weird technique. Like it, they're kind of fat and they're <laughs> stuck. Like his whole hand is like here, and then he's just doing the most delicate stuff. Yeah. But uh, but I think a lot of what makes it sound real is that there's a certain approach to to, to rhythm where either you're on top of the rhythm or you're, you're deeply in the rhythm. Oh yeah, that's my favorite part. This makes me go like this with my neck. <laughs> you want it to sound fly. In other words, you gotta know how to groove, a somewhat foreign concept to most classical musicians. Most classical music is all about sitting on top of the rhythm because we expect beats to be naturally flexible. But in this kind of music, I'm actually asking to, to forego that. One of my great pianistic idols is Art Tatum. You know, when you listen to what he's laying down with his left hand, right, this stride, bass, and the freedom of the right hand, I mean, the music is grooving, it's popping, it has a vibrancy to it. I mean, Horowitz is, is a huge fan of our table. He just went to a bar and like, oh, I wish we could play like that. <laughs> In his biography of Vladimir Horowitz, Harold Schoenberg tells the story this way. Horowitz was terribly impressed with Tatum's technique and his easy, natural way of playing and on one occasion couldn't understand how Tatum did what he did in T for Two. So he introduced himself, 
Tatum admitted that, yeah, he'd heard of Vladimir Horwitz. The two men had a pleasant talk, and then Horwitz asked Tatum how long it had taken him to learn T for two. Tatum looked at him as though he were crazy. I just made it up, he said. Horowitz's answer to Tatum was to create dazzling transcriptions of popular tunes to play his encore pieces, from T for Two to Stars and Stripes Forever, to Bizet's Carmen, where he really leans into the syncopations and adds colorful jazz-inspired runs. Another feature you can hear in Yuja and Horowitz's groovy playing is that neither is afraid of playing staccato. Compare their sound to the typical classical pianist drunk on Chopin's rubato. And Gershwin actually picked up on this a hundred years ago, writing, most pianists with a classical training fail lamentably in the playing of our ragtime or jazz because they just used the pedaling of Chopin when interpreting the blues. All guilt has to disappear when you pedal romantic music. Even when you see some dots, the composer wants you to detach the note with the help of the pedal. Our study of the great romantic composers has trained us in the method of the legato, whereas our popular music asks for staccato effects. The romantic touch is very good in a sentimental ballade, but in a tune of strict rhythm, it is somewhat out of place. Each note has its own articulation rather than being an insipid phrase like yeah. It's These are very different approaches to the fundamental structure of how the music is conceived. It's hard to, to actually live authentically in both worlds. Yuja seems to have already inhabited both worlds, as is evident in her rock too, where on the one hand, she shows off her romantic touch, And later in the same performance, you can hear her slap the keys right in the pocket in a way that would have made Gershwin smile. Given her many years listening to jazz, her one in a billion technique, her bionic ear, and her flair for adventure, when Yuja reached that place in the Abrams Concerto, which calls for her to improvise, she was ready. As far as we've come from Mozart, in a way, we've also come full circle. 18th century musicians were nothing if not improvisers, from which both composition and memorized performance were outgrowths. The cadenza was really for Mozart a vehicle to show, oh well, you know, I can improvise. I, I might throw in one of my opera tunes just for everybody's enjoyment. And that cadenza, of course, is just based on the word cadence and is basically just about five to one, except that between five and one, you can play a whole fantasy. And while pianists improvising their own Mozart concertos is mostly a lost art, save a few notable examples. He's making that up. Pianists like Jackie Parker have preserved the element of freedom in the use of popular quotations, updated for the age of TV and film. On the very night that the movie Star Trek IV was released in movie theaters, and I was stuck playing a Mozart concerto that night, and so my personal tribute went like this. A woman wrote in this review, she said, you know, if Mozart had been a Trekkie, he would have done that himself. It's the same spirit of reconciling classical forms with popular culture that Teddy Abrams brings to his entire concerto. All right, in this part coming up here, I'll explain in a second. That's the Warner Brothers theme. <laughs> <laughs>
What'd you say? That's the Warner Brothers theme. Dom, 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 dom. These are quiet quotes. These are for me to enjoy. Some so quiet and personal that they're classified. There's also one TV theme that's been hidden. I'm not gonna ever say. Okay, don't tell Teddy, but my working theory is that his secret quote is actually the Hannah Montana theme. I don't have any real evidence yet, but come on. Mix it all together, and you know that's the best of both worlds. Crossing over between classical and pop worlds. Just saying. In any case, take a listen and see if you can pick up on any subliminal TV themes. Meanwhile, the four, yes four, cadenzas in the Abrams Concerto are rich with cultural allusions and quotations. That first cadenza, which we saw was a kind of mashup between Art Tatum and Jerry Lee Lewis, ends four minutes later in a praise break. Then, after the orchestra is invited back in, the pianist breaks into rapid unison passage work reminiscent of the scherzo movement from Prokofiev's second concerto. If the Abrams concerto was the musical child of Rachmaninoff and Gershwin, Prokofiev was the midwife. Oh yeah, that's a Prokofiev II cadenza yes. moment. This is from the second cadenza of the Abrams concerto. Now, compare it with Prokofiev. Now, I never thought I'd say this, but there's actually a little bit of Jerry Lee Lewis in Prokofiev. Both high energy, ecstatic, with percussive ostinatos and zigzagging glissandi all over the keyboard. Prokofiev's harmonies are just slightly more discordant. But if you heard a little bit of Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff in that passage from the Abrams, you wouldn't be wrong either. Which is also itself like Tchaikovsky, first concerto, first condensed. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. And that, oh, this, like this, the this, yes, and okay, and this is this was my point. I wasn't <laughs> making so well. Exactly, that this is a direct Rachmaninoff. This is like. If you listen to this and go, oh, that's pastiche, you're like missing the point. This is a joking reinterpretation of this. It's not actually that. This is commentary on that and how it can be resynthesized. Serious musicians just don't know how to be tongue in cheek about music, yeah. so they might not get the irony. But, that, but um, is, this is absolutely done ironically, which is a big millennial thing. These spectacular virtuoso passages the Abrams Concerto ironically references were the culmination of a trend that developed throughout the 19th century, in which composers would fully notate these extended cadenzas, adding more and more razzle dazzle and often featuring grand restatements of the principal themes. The Grieg Concerto is case in point. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Grieg wrote all of this as arpeggios where the right hand and left hand alternate playing four notes each, like this. Four notes. And Percy Granger made a suggestion which was that it would be a lot more powerful if there was a kind of a martellato effect with, with the hands. Yuja worked together with Teddy in much the same way, making the piece her own, not just in her interpretation, but in rearranging and even rewriting certain passages to strengthen the effect that Teddy was going for. One of the really cool ideas you had was um, on the big trill that comes before the, the recap. Mm -hmm. You wanted to change that. You actually made it way harder. You just like, <laughs> something like that. But we couldn't like figure out the tempo. My signature move. Re remember we kept like <laughs> glitching out while we were trying to get it to work. Like you were like, do it like this. And they're like, it's in this tempo. And I was trying to give the cue me. It took like four times. <laughs> it eventually was way better the way you composed it. It's actually a co-composing. <laughs> Another way in which Yuja was the Granger to Teddy's Grieg was, in both cases, the composer admired the hell out of the pianist. This passage here, like this is so 
but like, when I came to visit you in December before we did it, had you already worked on that passage or were you still kind of just... No. <laughs> but you, you played it. You, you basically did. But it's, it's a pedrose. Yeah, but, but like, <laughs> this is not. Th this is not the repeated notes right there. It's not. It's not just... Yeah. It's not. A, that's not. Now, it's one thing to be technically capable of playing such impossible music, but it's an entirely different thing to be able to go up on stage and nail it in front of thousands of people. And when you're in the practice room, it's like... Yeah, no, okay. you know, in the practice room, is always fine. It's like, it's what's on the stage that counts, and, you know, have a little faith. And that faith gets stronger when you're prepared. And that takes a strong work ethic, one that you just shares with, of all people, the dude? Huh. Actually, I was talking with Jeff Bridges. Action. And then you just have to be on the spot. Like, same with the concert. Like, 8 o'clock, and you just have to go on stage. You, you know, I don't feel like playing this piece. He had the same thing to, to say. Like, it's all about the preparation. And in a concert, you, the only thing you can do is uh, empty. Empty all the worries and noise. Yeah, well, the dude abides. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I take comfort in that. polystylism, improvised jam sessions, cadenzas galore. This piece doesn't seem like one thing. It seems like a hundred things. Is there some glue that binds it all together? Is there something coherent here that is greater than the sum of its parts? Well, according to this Wall Street Journal review of the Abrams Concerto premiere, the answer is no, it doesn't. The article is entitled his concerto panders for praise. And that raises an interesting point. There's a fine line between honoring the diverse musics of the past and using popular styles to fish for compliments. What's the difference between pandering and homage? Well, for me... I don't uh, leave, no. No, no, no. <laughs> this is like, oh. <laughs> no but, but this, is, this is such a, a good question. It is. Because the way I use popular styles of music is very much about expressing like the, the, the kind of music that flows through my head at, at all times. I'm not trying to create a collage of these styles, but I'm actually trying to create a through line of music. A hundred years earlier, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue faced much the same criticism as the Abrams Concerto from high-minded critics, who saw it as a loose collection of catchy tunes. The philosopher, social critic, and giant party pooper, Theodor Adorno, refers to Gershwin's hits as relying on harmonic recipes borrowed from the so-called Slavic melancholy of Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff. Doesn't sound so bad to me. As for the use of quotation in composition, well, that's regressive and infantile. Similarly, the review of the Abrams Concerto calls it formulaic and empty fun. This is not about, like, pastiche. I believe it, the, the, the underlying features that, that make musical language work, they absolutely bind different styles of music together. Teddy's grand teacher, Leonard Bernstein, would agree. A piece's content can draw on popular materials, but still achieve formal unity. And yet, Bernstein didn't actually think the Rhapsody in Blue rose to this standard. The Rhapsody in Blue is so sectional and choppy that you can cut it interchange the sections, leave out half of it, play it backwards on the piano or the organ or the banjo or the kazoo. But as different as Adorno and Bernstein's aesthetics were, or for that matter, Teddy and his critics, they all more or less agree on what counts as a unified composition. As Adorno puts it, every detail derives its musical sense from the concrete totality of the piece, which in turn consists of the life relationship of the details and never of a mere enforcement of the musical scheme. The material that I, I developed at the very beginning, just like any hopefully great composer of the past, uh, unfolds as if the genetic information demanded the overall scope, right? It's like the macro is contained in the micro. Such art music, for lack of a better term, is autonomous, indivisible, self-generating, like an organism that isn't so easily dismembered into TV jingles and movie soundtracks. In the 20th century, if you were to do something so vulgar as, I don't know, write a piece that people actually liked, there would always be critics waiting to unleash their arsenal of verbal artillery. Trite, feeble, conventional, sentimental, vapid, fussy, futile, lifeless, derivative, stale. 
inexpressive. Man, the Rhapsody in Blue must really suck. Rachmaninoff knew this all too well, having been haunted by the popularity of his C-sharp minor prelude for his entire adult life. This is something that, as you'd expect, has bothered popular musicians for decades. For example, a young Mick Jagger once claimed that he'd rather be dead than still be playing Satisfaction into his 40s. Similarly, Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto may have cured his writer's block and saved his composing career, but it also became in some ways too popular for his own good. Themes from every movement have been turned into popular ballads, from Frank Sinatra, Full moon and empty to Eric Carmen. Nobody's home. Or if you're a millennial like me, Celine Dion. Meanwhile, Hollywood found in Rock 2 both love <laughs> and lust. Rock my love. The second piano concerto. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't ever stop. Why did you stop? Rachmaninoff was said to have hit the very center of everyday Philistine musical taste. Adorno pointed out that this was becoming true of all concert music. Adorno wrote, The man who in the subway triumphantly whistles loudly the theme of the finale of Brahms' first symphony is already primarily involved with its debris. Only the rather unmelodious 12-tone music of Arnold Schoenberg had the chance to avoid the prison cell of Tin Pan Alley and radio. Yet Schoenberg himself looked forward to the day that, quote, even male boys will whistle his tunes. Schoenberg had this to say about his tennis buddy Gershwin. Many musicians do not consider George Gershwin a serious composer, but they are only serious on account of a perfect lack of humor and soul. A real composer does not ask whether his products will please the experts of serious arts. He only feels he has something to say and says it. In their own different ways, Rachmaninoff, Gershwin, and yes, even Schoenberg were romantics at heart, grappling with the cultural and ideological pressures of the modern age. Rachmaninoff called himself, quote, a ghost wandering in a world made alien. Yet, in the quarter century between his third concerto and Paganini Rhapsody, Rachmaninoff explored more dissonant harmonies and complex forms. Not exactly something you can whistle in the subway. It wasn't until the 18th variation of the Paganini Rhapsody that Rachmaninoff finally gave in, telling his friend Horowitz that, quote, I wrote this one for my manager. I heard Rachmaninoff said, this melody probably will save the piece. <laughs> Not bad, Mr. Connors. You say this is your first lesson? Yes, but my father was a piano mover, so. And yet, the 18th variation isn't some kind of commercial break inside the Rhapsody. It shares the same Paganini DNA as every other variation, just a bit more disguised. What binds the, the, the Paganini, which is completely a genius piece, the, you know, and then the, the biggest um, melody that everyone knows about that piece is this, and that's uh, upside down. And this kind of Beethovenian obsession with organic unity permeates Rachmaninoff's compositions. Just take the second concerto, the whole of which is basically constructed from a couple terse motives, including this cross figure, which shows up everywhere in different guises. and most thrillingly, is coupled with the opening theme at the height of the first movement. A 
everything is connected a little bit to everything else in a more tight way, which is interesting because Rachmaninoff was sometimes not considered a great architect in music, and there was a certain snobbish element, especially in modern music, that Rachmaninoff, well, he's a salon composer. He writes this beautiful, pretty schmaltzy music, which is very nice, but it's not important. It kind of overlooks the unbelievable craftsman that he was. In the same way in your country, though, it's like there's few themes you, you follow through and then they kind of interact and then they, it becomes a story. I'm all about economy of thematic material. You, you pretty much in the first two bars of the piece you write everything that, that determines how the rest of the piece will unfold. Oh my god, I did not know this <laughs> That, that oh, oh, uh, ascending three note thing, then it goes back down, that's what, what generates this clarinet too. I've tried to throw every contrapuntal tool I've got because in the end, like, that's the thing that binds these pieces together. That's the thing that separates something from just being cutouts of styles and makes it something that is a unified whole. What I, what I call, like, the, the appositura theme. Like, right there, the D, 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 that will come constantly throughout the whole piece. Exactly. What you was just playing is the second movement material, if you think of it as a second movement. That's all that is, just two descending thirds. So it's the appositura theme and the descending third theme together, and it turns into this melody. It's kind of a, a neo-romantic, hopeful melody. Even the virtuosic passage work of the cadenzas reveal Teddy's dedication to the architecture of the work. Repeated note motive will be used in lots of different ways now eventually. It'll be transformed into, into actual literal repeated note technique in the piano. Incidentally, repeated note themes are found throughout Gershwin's work. Some have suggested this stems from his rather pushy personality, but in any case, they're in his piano preludes and both Rhapsodies. Then there's this slow theme from the Concerto in F, which, like the Abrams Concerto, prefigures the driving repeated notes of the third movement. By the way, the, the apotheosis of the repeated note thing is right there. Right. Mm -hmm. Like the repeated notes go after they like lose their mind. See, I did seconds. not think about all of that. I think it was enough for Yuja just to have to learn what might be the hardest piano concerto ever composed and also help compose it. Yuja makes this part up coming up. Right here. Oh, the right hand. She made it harder. This is not what I wrote. She made it even harder to play. Wait, what did you and write? I, I just wrote the same thing. What did, what did you do, Yuja? I just went up. Instead yeah. of repeat the E, I went. right here <laughs> is the, of course, is the second theme, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's also the theme of the fugue. That's right. Teddy manages to bake in a fugue amid everything else. This is starting to seem less like Rachmaninoff and Gershwin's musical child, and more like a trans-historical orgy involving every major musical figure from Bach to Beyonce. To be honest, as interconnected as the Abrams Concerto might be, there's so much going on, so much happens that it's hard to know what it's all about. But I have some ideas. Yuja's in a time machine. The piano is the time machine. And she's flying through the 19th and 20th centuries, like visiting these genres and, and sometimes jamming with them. Sometimes like, all right, I'm gonna go somewhere new now. It's a new oh, cadenza, cool. right? I know. So doesn't you it, should it, write programs. And, and like, it's like the solo part, you, 
is the subjective mind, you're the one experiencing, and then the orchestra is the objective like styles that you're visiting, like the places you're visiting, right? Like it a time like, traveler? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's just me. I, I don't know if that resonates with either of you. In, in a way, only the pianist is real. Like the orchestra is the stuff they conjure. How would you know the difference between the dream world and the real world? You know what I mean? And like you just wander into like your own fantasy, but the real stuff is the, you know, the condensed. So that's it's like the virtual real reality piece. shit. Something like that. <laughs> this is getting trippy. So basically you're, you hallucinated that Teddy would even existed. Uh, he wasn't conducting, it was all in your head. It's possible. It has that, you know, octane, high motivation and positive and... Very much meant for the moment that we were in, which was one of the dark moments in recent history. But this was intended to be a kind of uplifting. counteracting, uplifting way of, of digesting, um, you know, the world. And understanding that social context affords us another way of reading this music. And part of it is saying, look, we're super distracted by things that are really tough, so I'm not going to let you get comfortable enough to go back into that sad place. Like, I'm going to throw something out. There is another party right. coming every, every two seconds. This music represents the pent-up energies of a billion people locked down in isolation from one another, figuring out new ways to hate each other, it's an ecstatic outcry for collective identity and togetherness in the midst of social isolation. Like, I did think about not playing the piano anymore during the pandemic. And I was really happy actually the first few months, like, I don't have to travel, I don't have to play, I don't have to drive my adrenaline to the roof every day. And I wasn't even listening to music, I was doing everything else other than music. Like reading, cooking, <laughs> having bike fish, riding. bike riding, and any, well, Netflix and I guess chill. <laughs> Um, yeah, randomly one day I was like walking and he called and was like, just, this is written for you. And then I start looking at the score and that's when I start creeping up to play the piano again. It is a thing that makes you happy to listen to it, but it's because of how you played it. It's an extremely fun piece. And if you don't like any part, you can always skip over to the next part. <laughs> and that's not a diss, at least in my experience. God knows how many times I got impatient listening to Horowitz's Rock 3 with Ormandy and just fast forwarded to the last page so I could feel the goosebumps all over again. But then we listen again and are taken by a new passage and start noticing new connections. This is all just part of getting to know great music intimately so it can grow in our minds and our hearts. So when it comes to a work with the breadth and complexity and diversity of the Abrams Concerto, there's no requirement to have to experience it as one grand unified structure. And composers are always changing and rethinking and reinterpreting their work. A reviewer for Arts Louisville wrote glowingly about the Abrams Concerto, but also said that it could use some editing, that it needs to be honed a little more and it's probably still being tweaked as I write this article. And there's nothing wrong with that. Sure, Teddy might rework parts of his concerto one day, and if he did, he'd join the company of all the composers we've been talking about. And it's not just Rhapsody in Blue, but so many pieces in this genre that we love don't have just one single identity. Rachmaninoff's first and fourth concertos were both revised decades after their premiere. He was perennially insecure about the finished status of his works. His second trio was revised multiple times, and he practically eviscerated his second sonata, the original of which is still preferred by many pianists. Rock 3 features alternative passage work written in small notes above the staff throughout the piece, including a colossal cadenza that Rachmaninoff had replaced with a smaller and leaner, more structurally integrated one. I mean, every time a work is performed, it is in a sense recomposed, reinflected, reinterpreted according to a unique conception, as conductors and soloists search for new truth in the score. As for Teddy Abrams, it was MTT who taught him how to do that. His way, though, of thinking about music is always to ask the question behind the question, not just what is there, but why is it there? What's the deeper meaning for this music's existence? And that's what was so remarkable about you all those years ago. You kept digging. You, like, you were so obsessed with trying to find that subtext, that meaning. That was, that was what was driving you, I, I felt. Oh, for sure. But I think that's a, the Chinese philosophical really? <laughs> background also, yeah. Like Dao Te Ching, like the, the things is not what is appear, is what's behind them, and, and I feel like music is the pathway to get to that truth. The only trouble with the Abrams Concerto is, it's not clear who else can play it. She first played that, 
I would, I like, have never smiled that hard because I didn't know it was physically possible to play it. Obviously, written for Jesus, because nobody else in the world could probably do that as well as she did it. Is this, is this now a catch twenty-two? Like, will a piece ever be played if only one person can play it? All the more reason to listen to this recording. Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Oh, there's a Gershwin. <laughs> yes. Wraps it in blue here. Well, many people would say it's very superficial, so you can't, you can't please everybody. Just like Teddy's concerto wouldn't exist without Gershwin, this video wouldn't exist without Gershwin biographer Richard Crawford one of the pioneering historians of American music. In preparing this video, I wanted to correspond with Rich about some questions I had surrounding Gershwin and Rachmaninoff. And in a coincidence I still can't wrap my mind around, not only did I find out we lived in the same town, he lived across the street. So I just had to walk over and say hello. This video is for you, Rich.